Hey everybody, I'm Smriti, I'm one of the fourth years, uh, and welcome to my senior lecture. If you don't know who I am, well, now's your chance, so this is me. <laughs> um, so to choose my topic, I thought about what my trajectory has been in residency. And uh, I thought about my first day as an intern, which was my first month uh, on medicine, actually. It was my first rotation. And um, as an aside, I, that was the only time I ever dressed up for work, and I was asked within two minutes if I had worked overnight, so I never dress up again. Um, but anyway, <laughs> on that day, I thought about what I'd always kind of heard as a queer immigrant woman, which is keep your head down, just assimilate, you're gonna be fine. Spoiler alert, that didn't work. You all know this, um, but had I done that, I still would have been fine. I would have been a good resident and I would still be standing here giving you my lecture. Um, but my topic would have probably been this. Um, but in those very first two weeks of residency, that resolve to keep my head down and assimilate was challenged immediately. I was on a team with an attending who had a, a solid reputation for being homophobic and sexist and racist. And um, that behavior was on display every day at work. And it all kind of came to a head when he verbally assaulted my English speaking minority woman senior who was born and raised in New York um, and he assaulted her about her English. And in that moment, I was faced with an opportunity um, because I was facing something that I did not stand for. It was blatantly wrong. And I felt that I really did have to say something, even though I was new um, and didn't really know anything. Um, <clears throat> and so I did use my voice and I spoke up uh, and he said to get out of his face and to leave the room. So as I got in that elevator heading downstairs, I mulled over all my choices. I was an intern. This was my second or third week in residency and I was on an off service rotation. So I could send some anonymous feedback like so many people had done before. I could ask to be switched to a different team. I could also put laxatives in his morning coffee. Um, or I could tell somebody. I could tell someone who had authority, someone who would share my perspective on the matter, um, or someone who had a voice that they could use to support me. And as I mulled over these choices, I thought about what it means to have that voice. Does it mean I actually have it? Does it mean that I believe it? And how do I develop it so that I can be that person for somebody else in the future? Just four years ago, I was that intern being kicked out of a room. I was angry um, because I'd used my voice and no one wanted it, uh, or that person didn't want it. And four years later, I'm standing here. I'm the chair of our current diversity, equity, and inclusion health staff council, a council whose structure I helped, I helped write, um, and I've now led it for the first year. And kind of that journey from being that intern to who I am now was a very long stepwise process. I made a lot of mistakes and then I made them all over again. And then I learned some stuff and then I made some new mistakes and learned more things. And so my lecture today is to help you structure your thinking so that you too can find your voice and create your legacy at this amazing place. Uh, before I start telling you about finding your voice, I want you to think about why your voice matters. Much of what we do in the emergency room is advocating for patients. You want them to get a monitored bed, timely intervention, vaccines, preventive care. You advocate for your patients. And if you're an intern and you're wondering, does my voice matter? Is this lecture applicable to me? I want you to know that it absolutely does matter. Your voice 100% matters. And what you can do with it changes at every single level. You, it could be you, your colleagues, you could be advocating for your patients or your community, but that voice matters and it will develop. So just like everything else in residency, it's a graduated process. Um, you can't speak for your residency and your specialty uh, if you feel flattened on the phone by a consultant or a uh, conflict with an ancillary staff member. Um, everyone's got a different roadmap for finding their voice. I'm going to go through mine, but everyone's starts at the same place and that's in the clinical area. And there's two big steps to finding your voice in the clinical area. Out of respect for our education PDs, uh, you know, the first step is very straightforward. It's to be a good resident, it's to be a good doctor. That's what you're here for. You're here to be teachable and competent. So if you don't find your, if you're not really working to be a good doctor, it's very hard to, um, that was a mistake, uh, space bar. But anyway, <laughs> but uh, it's very straightforward. You wanna prove your mettle as a physician first. But the second half of it is what I really wanna talk about. Um, our jobs involve making very quick and life-changing decisions with very little information in very little time, with very many distractions, with very few resources for very vulnerable people. And because you're in that situation, you have to advocate for your patients a lot and also many times for yourself. 
And where there's advocacy, there's implicitly conflict. Because if there wasn't conflict, why do you need to advocate for anything? Why do you need to fight for something if you if you have it? Um, and so the most the kind of the first step is to find your voice in conflict. Finding your voice in conflict will make you better at advocating for yourself and your colleagues and also for your patients. Um, and then finding your voice as, an, as a good advocate will help you find your voice in the community. And once you've established yourself as somebody who cares about the community and has done something to, um, has goals and has established relationships to establish those, you can find your voice as a leader, which helps you leave your legacy here. Let's get right into it. Um, you can't talk about advocacy without talking about conflict and you can't talk about conflict without talking about anger. Anger is an incredible emotion. It can fuel resistance, rebellion, change, and it can also be a very destructive emotion. It can ruin your power and your credibility within seconds. And unfortunately, that's even more true if you're a woman or a minority, particularly if you're both. So managing that anger, particularly as an intern, felt very hard for me because it was, for the first time in my life, conflict was a part of my day every single day. And also, I was very new to the nuances of ED management. You don't really, you're still learning everything. And I couldn't understand why do I have to advocate for patients at all? I think that everyone should be here. Everyone's here because they care about patients. So why doesn't everyone want what I want? Um, and during my first ED block, uh, a staff member whose job it is to ensure safe discharges told me it wasn't his job to find shoes for a patient that I was discharging in the dead of winter. My senior and my attending both told me, Smriti, there's no point arguing. This person's been here a long time. Just move on with your life. We'll figure out something else. And I was all gung-ho, like, I'm going to do something. I'm going to say something. And I knocked on his door, and I started the conversation very nicely. And it ended with me telling him to throw his degree in the trash and find another job. Um, and then I had to put, a patient, put the patient in an Uber and send her home. That did not benefit anyone at all. There's thousands of books and papers that can tell you about conflict resolution, but I'm here to tell you how to think about your anger so that you can use it as a tool and not a destructive power. Um, and least of all, you know, just a waste of your time. So the first thing is that everyone deals with anger differently based on who you are, what you've dealt with in your life, uh, your, your response to anger will be different and using a one size fits all approach doesn't necessarily work. Um, are you the type of person who goes blank when you're angry? Do you see red when you're angry? Do you tend to regret saying something or do you tend to regret not saying anything at all and then you're upset like five days later? Um, you also, what triggers you? Is it certain patients? Is it certain cases? Is it sexual assault? Is it domestic violence? Is it being called Mr. or nurse? Is it certain consultants that piss you off? Knowing what triggers you and what your response is to anger and then practicing tackling that all the time in, at home with your friends, with your family will help you gain control in any conflict in the future. So you have to know who you are. Oh. Hello. <laughs> oh, there you go, okay, just click, all right. Um, <laughs> so the next step is uh, your timing. So my dad is a very wise guy. Uh, he is very good at dealing with anger because, well, he's my dad, so he's had to deal with it. And uh, he always said that when you say something in anger, it's like shooting an arrow in the dark. You have no control over where it goes. Once it's shot, you can't bring it back and you don't know who it's gonna hurt. Getting over that immediate amygdala response is, is very difficult because it's evolutionary. Anger is an evolutionary response. Um, and one of, one of somebody that I have respected ever since I was in med school, Dr. Benson, she taught me about the three second rule. Um, the next time you're in conflict and you see red or you go blank or whatever it is, just take one deep breath, three seconds long. What that does is it helps settle down that amygdala response and you can delineate your thoughts. It may not work the first time, the second time or the 10th time, but the more you practice it, the better you will get at it and you will get better at conflict. The next, the next step is your battles. You, which battles are you gonna pick? You're gonna face battles all the time on the phone, um, even leading up to, you know, in the CAT scanner, wherever, wherever you go in the ED. And if you fight every single battle, you're going to burn out. And also you're going to lose credibility when you actually want to fight for something that you really, really care about. So whenever you're faced with a battle and you're faced with that anger, just ask yourself one simple question. Which battle that if you do not choose is going to make you less you? What is so inherent to your core value that you have to say something? And... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, 
I'm just having uh, IT issues as always. Uh, <laughs> sorry, okay, I got it. All right. Um, so a staff member not helping me with my patient's shoes is, uh, it's not, it wasn't going to not let me sleep at night. Um, it was just gonna satisfy my ego and that was a battle I should not have chosen. However, exposing a physician who uses you know, homophobia and racism and sexism in his daily life and practice was absolutely a battle that I wanted to choose because I really cared about it. And that battle I fought extensively. Your next step is why? Why are you fighting? What is your interest? And there's a lot of business uh, talks about conflict, about how you should focus on your interest in conflict and not your position. The problem with our anger in the ED is that it often comes from an interest in advocating for a patient so that you inherently are way more invested in the situation than the other person. So if you take the focus away from your position, for example, I want you to admit this patient to your service and gear it to the interest, which is why do you want this patient to be admitted? You want a safe disposition for this patient. Um, you are more likely to get the other person interested in your cause. Position and interest don't always line up, but when they do, almost always the other person will arrive to the same position that you are in. So just take it easy and ask questions that gear them towards your interest. And lastly, the most important thing to practice is after conflict. It's reflection, debrief, and channeling. It can be over a few beers with your residents, but it can also be in real time with your senior and attending talking about, all right, what happened just now? Was I right to be angry or was I wrong to be angry? Was I totally wrong? Was that the right outcome for the patient? Why did I behave the way I did and what triggered me? Why did that person behave? And the more you break it down, the more practice you get at realizing what you are like in anger. And you're just going to get better and better at doing this every time. And I'm not going to have you just take my word for it. I want to, you know, to prove to you that this works, I'd like to contrast my last story with another story that was more recent and a story that everyone can relate to. Who here has not ever had an argument with PIC or MAR? Right, all of us, right? And I wanted to admit a patient who was basically showing unmistakable signs of dementia. Um, and it wasn't until that, visit, I'd seen her a bunch of times in the ED and it wasn't until that day that I realized this woman was playing Russian roulette with all her pills. She would just take any combination of what she thought she was supposed to take and she'd come in with different flavors of metabolic derangements. But because she was kind of functional, we would just fix her, send her home and then she'd come back. And this time it was very clear that, you know, it just, it just wasn't gonna work anymore. She needed a safe disposition. Um, so I called PIC, I wanted to admit the patient, um, and you know, it kind of went the way you'd expect it to go. There was some pushback, there was a lot of interrupting, there was some miscalling. Um, and knowing who I am and what I'm like in conflict, I used the very tools that I just talked about. I took my three seconds, I focused on my interest, and I told him that what I wanted was a safe dispo for the patient, and if he'd be so kind to come down and help me with that, we can talk about it. My position and my interest lined up here because there was no other dispo really. And so I asked him a set of carefully targeted questions that made him arrive to the same conclusion as me. I didn't let the argument go. I still debriefed the conversation with him in person about what made him so angry and what we can do to work on this better in the future. In the end, this person not only thanked me for debriefing the conversation, but actually went to my attending and said he was really happy about the conversation. So the end result of the situation was that I was able to successfully navigate conflict in order to advocate for a patient. And that's why your voice in conflict directly makes you a better advocate. This is anger. This was Hannah when I told her that there was no more cheese left at the taco stand at Angela's house. Um, this is Adrian doing the three second rule. This is where he goes, that's his happy place. <laughs> anyway, um, so how do you take this one step further? How do you use your voice in conflict to advocate for change? Whoops, still, hold on. Sophia, it's not going uh, bullet by bullet. <laughs> Is it this to show up and? One at a time. Oh, okay, never mind. I got it, all right, sorry. You so, it? yeah, okay. I'll take a PowerPoint class next time. <laughs> um, so how do you take this one step further? <laughs> how do you use your voice in conflict to advocate for change? Uh, this is supposed to come one by one, but clearly. So first you have to um, figure out what you want to change, right? Your anger can guide you through that because deep seated, unshakable anger comes from a place of passion. And once you've been in residency for a little bit, you know the status quo at your institution. You also know how to choose your battles a little bit. So whenever you choose the same battle over and over again, you're saying that this is the status quo that I am not okay with. This is my line in the sand that I'm drawing. And that's where you start to identify what you're passionate about changing. And then you have a choice. Do you wanna fight it in real time at every single occurrence? 
Or do you want to channel your anger into your passion to hit it at its root? So I had fought very hard and very tactfully against that attending on my medicine rotation. And I succeeded in getting him punished. And I was very happy with that outcome. But it wasn't the first or the last microaggression that I was ever going to deal with. And after that instance, every time I fought something similar, I never had the same success again. Every time I faced gender bias in the ED or racial bias in the ED, or I saw my patients being discriminated against, I got angry and I'd choose that battle and more often than not, I'd lose it. And then I realized I was, my energy was just dwindling. Um, but I also just couldn't accept it. And that's how I figured out that discrimination in medicine in all forms was a thing that I was passionate about changing. And once you know what you're passionate about changing, you need to identify the need. Is it a singular survival need? Is it you want, you're passionate about getting a safe disposition for domestic violence patients? Is it a larger community need? Like you wanna close the meal gap in Brooklyn? Or is it a larger population need like gender discrimination in medicine? Once you know the scale of what your need is, you can identify what resources are already available. Are there people out there in established organizations that are already doing things that you wanna establish? Is there a way for you to network with them? Or are there, is there nothing in, in the literature about it and you want to actually be the pioneer there. And then just as importantly, what is your asset that you can bring to the table? And I know that many people, because we're residents, we're insecure. Are you thinking, what, do I have any assets? Like, what is my asset? And I wanna tell you that you do have assets. The fact that you're here in this unique group of people means someone invited you to the table because they saw something in you. So you have an asset, but you may need someone to find it for you. You may need someone to fine tune it for you. You may need to find a person who has been through the process and can guide your experience. You may need someone who just has more life experience than you and can coach your personal growth. Or you may need someone to sponsor an opportunity for you that you wouldn't otherwise had, have had or a connector who can put you in touch with those people. Basically, you need to identify your super team. I had a very large super team. Um, I had mentors and coaches and sponsors and connectors. I had Dr. Kendall and Dr. Bloyam kind of as my life coaches, um, sort of just talking things out with me all the time and, and letting me vent to them to no end. Um, I had Locasio and Willis and Silverberg as my mentors. And I had Dr. Smith as my connector and my sponsor and kind of my tiger mom throughout residency. Um, she was my program director at the time and she was very keenly aware of what I was passionate about and also what I was angry about. She also knew how angry I was um, and realized that I needed to channel it in some way. She helped me identify an asset to me that was writing. And then she connected me to a few different women who had already done so much work in the process um, that I could just get involved with them. And as a result, I ended up writing the script for a feminine podcast episode on double the minority and double the bias. And I'm now working on another script advocating against the use of chokeholds for Dr. Smith's Bellevue friend um, in California. But my point is that you're able, I was able to channel my anger into something I was passionate about and that helped me participate on a larger platform of advocacy. This is Sophia advocating for something. <laughs> I, think it's the, I think it's for Chris to come out more. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, for him to eat, I think so. Um, here is Sophia, the super team. And here's another example of some kind of team. Uh, that's Hope, Taylor, and Hannah, if you can't tell. Um, I wanna stop here for a second and talk about hurdles. Uh, this is also the step, right? When you're kind of at the end of second year and figuring out like what you really care about and you're starting to take some steps into advocacy. Um, this is a step where you will encounter hurdles that can either throw you off your path or if overcome, set you definitively towards having a powerful voice. And there, you can have an entire different lecture on what kind of hurdles you'll, you'll face. Um, but I wanna just talk about one specific one that all of us face as residents and it's very insidious. And at some point in your residency, everyone in your class is gonna be looking for their voice. You're gonna notice that people are getting involved in journal clubs and um, papers and projects and national leadership positions like Angela. Um, and you're gonna find yourself wondering, am I actually as good as them? Uh, you're gonna start comparing yourself to them. And it's really hard not to, especially for me, because my class is the best class that ever existed. But, <laughs> but if there was ever an opportunity available, uh, you know, to lead a, lead a journal club or apply for a grant or whatever, I inherently thought of other people in my class who I thought could do this way better than me. Um, and I was moping about this to Dr. Silverberg sometime during my second year, because I was like, you know, I wonder, you know, why I feel like everyone's better than me, blah, blah, blah. Um, he said that many residents think so much in advance about their abilities and the final product, and they tie their self-esteem so much to that picture of what the final product should be, that they give up without even trying. 
you get so anxious about what your meal is going to taste like you don't even bother to open the recipe book. And residents who tend to, he said that residents who tend to be more involved are the ones that don't think so hard about it. If they find something interesting, they'll ask why not, and they'll just take a crack at it. Because what you need to understand is that in residency, you're not alone. You're going to have seniors, attendings, faculty, PDs, everyone's looking at your work. And all you need to do is just take the initiative, create a Google Doc, share it. And within a few days, you're going to have insight and advice and a whole process. And by the end of that process, you'll have learned so much that you're suddenly good at the very thing you did not even want to try. So my big lesson here is to be aware of how your self-esteem can influence your participation. Don't tie your self-esteem to, to a specific project. You're much bigger than that. You're, you're a person with an entirely unique group of experiences um, and skills. So if you're interested in something, just take a crack at it. And the worst thing you'll do is fail, which will just put you on a path to something else. This is short. Um, <laughs> refusing, just pushing down the hurdle of Tarek, I think, taking a picture of her. Um, <clears throat> I really tried to make these point by point. I don't know what happened, but anyway, so last year, um, so after becoming, after having advocated uh, sort of online and on a larger platform outside of the hospital, um, I was set kind of on a different journey and that was my voice in the community. Last year, we were very tired and we were really angry. We served on the front lines of a pandemic that reinforced healthcare inequity and systemic racism. We were reminded again just how unsafe and vulnerable our patients are. They incurred disproportionate losses compared to other groups, and they were still not safe from violence, not even from people sworn to protect them. I was restless, we were all restless, and I wanted to channel my anger in a way that was influential. And to do that, I had to know what we all needed again, and what I specifically could do to fill it. The need for me came in the form of my friends. I came to work every day to find my black friends and black patients exhausted. They had been shouting their voices forever, fighting the same things that generations before them had been fighting. What our black friends and patients needed was allyship. The need was for someone else to also shoulder the responsibility and amplify the sound against racism. The need was to take all of our collective anger and channel it into something big that could inspire change so that they're not alone fighting everything by themselves. So how do I do that? It was a, kind of a huge thought to think of. And how do you inspire an entire community? Um, I knew I could speak up, I knew I could write well, but how do I start? What could I do to first influence my surroundings in my own context before taking on the whole burden of systemic racism? And one afternoon, Noah Berland, Stephanie Gopal and I decided that we wanted to arrange a peaceful dying demonstration on our hospital campus. Um, we'd have some speeches, we'd tell our residency on our WhatsApp group chat, and we'd just you know, lie down on the grass. Um, the conversation took about five minutes and we thought it was such a great idea and we're like, all right, let's just like start doing it. And that's when I, I kind of thought about my prior lessons about needing help, about needing a sponsor. And I made probably the smartest decision I made that day, that whole year, which is to call Dr. Smith. And I'm really glad I did it because within the first 15, 15 seconds of the conversation, it kind of went something like this. So Smithy, let me get this straight. You're going to lie down in the grass with your co-residents and not tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, in essence, what she was asking was, how are you going to take this small idea that you have and make it big? How are you going to amplify your voice? And that brings me again to sponsorship. In order to amplify your voice, you need a sponsor. You have to reach out to a person who can not only mobilize resources for you, but also has a vested interest in advancing your idea. The event was still ours. We designed the agenda, we chose the speakers, we decided what we wanted to say and what we wanted to do. But because of Dr. Smith, we had the backing of the CEO of the hospital. We had news coverage and a mic and a podium and office printing flyers for us, a photographer and a videographer. Basically, all I had to do was do the stuff that I really liked doing, which was writing and speaking and reaching out to people. All the, all the other stuff that makes it big and large and beautiful, but is harder, she kind of took care of for us. Um, and so after 72 hours of no sleep and consuming an entire coffee plantation and many pit stains, um, we made June 4th one of the most beautiful days of the year. We had powerful speeches and an inspiring agenda, and we got to hear from some of the best orators in our residency, like John Riggins. And this was a defining moment for me in finding my voice, not just because it was mine, but I was also able to amplify other people's voices. I had channeled my anger about discrimination into amplifying our collective voices onto a much larger platform. And then during my speech, um, which I cringe at if I ever hear it again, um, I implore people to not lose their momentum. 
I felt a collective movement happening that day of energy, revival, and resolve. And when you're faced with something that crucial and precious, you have to you have to crystallize it into something sustainable. Because otherwise, all you did is one great day, and then what's next? Um, and here's just some pictures from the Dian. This is uh, there's some beautiful posters that Priyanka and Hannah and a bunch of other people made. Um, so me standing next, next to Dr. Smith with, uh, I just realized now that my scrub pants, uh, the string tie is loose. Anyway, um, this is uh, uh, Paul, I think, and Calvin. This is Dr. Kendall. Um, this is me trying not to stammer. This is Keith. There's some beautiful voices out there. And uh, it was just one of the proudest days uh, of residency for me. And now, how does that voice in your community contribute to your legacy here at County. What defines your accomplishments here and what you leave behind for future generations? And in creating your legacy, the most important question is what is your why? Why did you become a doctor? Why did you choose emergency medicine? Also, why did you choose this residency? Many of us chose this residency because we are very passionate about addressing healthcare disparities. And that was for me, that was my why. I wanted to address healthcare disparities. I was passionate about fighting discrimination in medicine in every way. So once you know what your why is, get your plan. You have to find an actionable, measurable outcome. Thanks, Adrian. Um, and you have to identify your platform. Identify the people who are going to help you I, and, and just go for it. I had always thought that we would have much more robust community engagement and advocacy if only we had some kind of central infrastructure in the hospital that made it easy for 1,000 downstate residents to collaborate with each other on like-minded projects. I always felt like people would have amazing ideas for social justice and community advocacy, and then it just, you know, just goes floof somewhere in the 60 or 70 hour work weeks that you're working and, and you know, having to find resources yourself and reach out to people. And after the dying, I realized that the perfect way for me to channel that momentum was by creating that infrastructure right here and right now. I identified my platform, which was all residents of the hospital. That meant that the centralized office I needed to approach was GME. I collaborated with some of our core residents, some of who are, who are here, Adrian, Angela, Taylor. Um, and I proposed a structure for a council that runs healthcare equity and social justice products, projects across all specialties. It was to be run for residents by residents with faculty mentorship and funding. And due to the rapid turnover of residents, there would never be any stagnation. It would remain fresh and sustainable. Having made a plan on paper made it very easy to place it on the platform that it was intended for, which was the GME. And for me, GME really just meant Dr. Smith again. Um, she had recognized a need already for a DEI council, uh, and I'd already prepared a structure for something very similar. And that's how our DEI House Staff Council was born. We now have 89 members. Uh, we have about 20 leadership positions, uh, that therefore empowering a lot of different people to get involved. We have a robust set of projects and leaders and faculty advisors, and we also have a yearly budget, which is awesome. Um, this council is my legacy. This council was the result of a stepwise process in finding my voice and using it to make something new and sustainable that would continue to benefit future residents. And that's where I'm talking about support. I wouldn't have been able to do this if I didn't have the support from the GME. So you have to approach the right resources and the right platform. But also in leaving your legacy, support can never be one directional. Otherwise it's just gonna die with you. You have to genuinely want to benefit other people with your voice and you want to genuinely be able to promote other women and other people. Um, I would not have been here. Uh, many of the people who helped me to get here were in my position themselves at some point in their lives. And so it was also my turn to pay forward. Our DEI council works because we empower residents to speak their voices in the same way that I was empowered to speak mine. And it also gives them the tools and resources to do it. I have personally identified people in this residency with leadership skills and helped establish partnerships for them to take on and lead. For example, Kisandra, who is leading this brilliant um, peer reviewed peer lecture series with high school students. Um, and that's how I know that when I leave, this council is going to continue to grow and be led beautifully. I can really not stress this enough. You have to always look for opportunities to help other people and to continue nurturing other people in their growth. This is Gina trying to support me. Um, <laughs> she's failing pretty badly. And uh, actually I kind of slid down a little bit after this. Um, so in conclusion, uh, what I learned from channeling my anger and taking control in conflict led me to become a much better advocate. Um, what I learned about becoming a better patient advocate allowed me to find my voice as a community leader 
which eventually allowed me to create a sustainable legacy for the next generation of residents. And I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. A legacy can be interpreted in many different ways, and, and it does not have to, be, have to have a wide impact. Um, you can leave a legacy with a patient. How you treat them and care for them and advocate for them can leave a lasting legacy on their impression of who you are as a physician. And while that may not have a wide impact, you left an impact on the patient, which in my opinion is very significant. If you had to take only one thing away from this lecture, it's this. Every single one of you has a voice that matters. We live really weird lives. We, there are literally TV shows about what we do. Um, we see every tragedy and catastrophe and comedy and also bodily fluid and just strange things in, in orifices. But we even as residents are in the top 1% financially in the country. However, we're, and that means we're in a significantly more privileged and entitled world than the patients that we serve. We flit between their world and ours every day with the people in our lives outside of the hospital may not always have an understanding of what our patients go through. So your voices provide a window into that world so that other people with privilege can understand and contribute to a more equitable system for our patients. These are my references.